Welcome to our Animal Justice Academy panel, how to get people to care about fishes. So folks, yesterday, um, Animal Justice, we released not only the first farm uh, fish farm investigation in Canada, but the world's first caviar farm expose. And now we are calling on a ban on caviar in Canada. So fishes are top of mind for us right now. And in light of these findings, we wanted to bring together a brilliant panel of scientists, lawyers, and campaigners um, together to talk tonight, uh, not only about this investigation, but mostly about how the hell do we start changing things for fishes. So um, before we dive in fully, in the spirit of social justice for all, let's just acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all lands that uh, those of us that are gathering here today throughout the world are on. In Canada, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people who call this land home. And a special acknowledgement um, to those civilians in war zones right now, we hold your safety in our hearts and hope deeply for peace. And of course, the billions of animals suffering in the world right now, we are gathered for you tonight. So a big welcome to those of you who are new to Animal Justice Academy community. Uh, AJ is a training program, an action collective, and a community for animal advocates. If you're not already an official aja -er, you can sign up for free at animaljusticeacademy.com. And what happens when you sign up? You get instant access to our six-week animal advocacy course. And it's not a little six weeks, folks. It's a robust course. Um, even if you've been in animal advocacy for decades, there's something for you to learn here. Um, you'll get to join our active and private Facebook group, which I think is one of the sweetest places to hang out in the AR online world. And you'll receive uh, notices of our collective actions and first notice of our events. I want to introduce you to our lovely panelists. Um, actually, I'm going to have them introduce themselves to you. Um, so, so panelists, I'm going to give you each a minute or so to say hi, introduce who you are, what you do, and your involvement with the fishes. And Jonathan, do you mind starting us off here tonight? No problem with that, uh, Kimberly. Thanks for introductions. Nice to see so many people on the call. I'm Jonathan Balcom. I'm an ethologist, which is a biologist who specializes in animal behavior. And I spent much of my, most of my working career, well, I'm still working now, but I'm doing my own projects, retired with a small R. But I worked for several animal protection organizations after getting a PhD in ethology, studying communication in bats, very esoteric work. And uh, animals are my clients. Uh, I consider them to be that, and I'm proud to work for them. And just delighted to see organizations like Animal Justice do the work that they do. Mm. Jonathan, we love you. Jonathan is a part of the um, investigation video that we put out yesterday, as is Angela um, and Chow. Um, and so um, we're so, uh, we love collaborating with you. And uh, and some of you may have seen Jonathan's, uh, was on a panel about a year and a half ago, and we just love having you here, Jonathan. So, so welcome. Thank you. Um, let Chow, how about we go to you next? Absolutely. Thank you so much. First off, I want to say thank you for having me here. You're an incredible host. I'm oh. so glad to be here with the AJA community. Um, so hi, my name is Chow. I am a researcher and lab manager at the Water Lab at NYU. That's led by Becca Franks. And we are all about using science-based scholarship to advance animal welfare and reveal multi-species interests. But I'm not just all about sitting in my ivory tower. Prior to joining the lab, I was with Fish Welfare Initiative, and we were working with low-income subsistence farmers to improve the welfare conditions of farmed milkfish. And I'm also happy to say that I'm a certified freediver, and I love spending time observing fish in the wild. Amazing. Yeah, you you don't you don't just talk your talk, you swim your talk. <laughs> I love that chow. <laughs> Thank you. It's so good to have you here. Thank you. Um, um, okay, we let's um, let's talk to Angela. Angela Fernandez, would you give us a little intro? Thanks so much, Kimberly. It's so good to be here, and I always love to come, well, to watch, but also to be a part of on these panels with you. It's so much fun. Um, I'm a law professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto, and I'm also cross-appointed in the History Department. Um, 
And I teach the animal law class at U of T and supervise there the Canadian Animal Law Digest, which probably many of you um, subscribe to. If you don't, please subscribe. Um, and uh, you get updates on Canadian animal law every couple of weeks. It's so and, rich. I, um, have to inter I have to interrupt. It's such a rich a digest. I mean, I'm in this all the time and I learn stuff all the time. So thank you, Angela, for putting that together. Well, my research associate at U of T, she really does the heavy lifting on it. And I'm always so happy because before I go into my class to teach, I kind of like basically can teach from it almost. And I know like nothing's going to come up that I actually don't already know about, which is <laughs> an amazing feeling, you know, when you're in the classroom. Love uh, it. But I would say for fishes, my interest comes from different directions. But I, I mean, first and foremost, I grew up in St. John's in Newfoundland. So I grew up in a place where like nobody ever thought twice about instrumentalized use of fish. And so, you know, um, for me coming to animal um, issues, like probably about a decade ago, I, um, fish were not first and foremost in my mind, but, you know, my child who's about 15 now had said to me, you know, fish was my favorite animal. Why are we eating them? I don't want to eat them anymore. And, you know, we cut out chicken, but I like fish more than chickens. And anyway, so the, just that whole experience really just made me give it a very deep think. And I've kind of come to think that when we talk about animals, like any theory for animals, like it's got to include all of the sentience. And if it doesn't, then it's just not a good enough theory or a good enough approach. And so fish for me are really like the kind of the limits for that or the paradigm for that. Amazing, Angela. So good to have you here all the time. <laughs> Uh, amazing. Um, okay, Sofika Kostinyak, my my good Ukrainian friend. <laughs> um, I'm so happy to have you here. This is your first time in Animal Justice Academy, um, and we're so honored to have you here. Can, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much, Kimberly. I know I am in fantastic hands because you are leading this fine evening. Um, what a wonderful gathering. I'm super enthusiastic about learning from each of the panelists and uh, hearing from the audience. But um, a little bit about myself. So I'm an ecologist by training. I actually started off my career in an engineering consulting firm outside of Toronto doing environmental assessments and sampling streams for different types of aquatic animals that were popping up when we were electrocuting them. Um, so the, that's my first interface with uh, aquatic animals in the professional world. Um, around 2000, I moved out to the West Coast to Vancouver, and I immersed myself in the nonprofit world, where I started getting far more connected to the issues way closer to the ground. And I got into the ocean conservation space. For the next probably 15 or so years, I was very much involved in ensuring that habitat was not destroyed, that biodiversity was a priority, that we understood the link between oceans and climate health and coastal ecosystem health, um, as well as sustainable seafood. So prior to joining Aquatic Life Institute, where I'm the managing director, I was the director of OceanWise, which is Canada's largest seafood ratings agency. And so much good work happens there, but in all those years and all those conversations, all those networks, the individuals that were trapped and continue to be trapped in the system, both in the farmed environment and wild environment, were not considered. They're thought of as tons, as commodities, as fisheries, as pallets, but not individuals. About three years ago, I was on a, uh, on a call and somebody started talking about aquatic animal welfare. And I was so confused <laughs> for about a day or two. I was like, what on earth is going on here? There was a paradigm shift going on in my consciousness. And from that day forward, I thought, now I know. Now I know better. I have to do something about it. And that's how I made my way into the animal welfare space. And it's been an unbelievable learning journey every single day since. Sofika, thank you. And thank you for just showing the progression and, you know, how knowledge uh, is transformational. So amazing. Um, and last but not least, my colleague at Animal Justice, Ben DeLang. It's so good to have you here. I know you have Hi. been in, like, you've been part of uh, these events and in the gallery and everything. But Ben, this is the first time we're putting you in the hot seat. That's right. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, and I'm going to give you a hard time, buddy. Uh, you already do anyways, even when we're offline. So. No surprises there. Um, 
No, I'm I'm just absolutely well. First off, uh, my name's Ben. Um, I'm investigations counsel with uh, Animal Justice. Um, also do some staff lawyer work for them. Um, my interest in fishes um, specifically kind of arises from the the evolution of the concept of speciesism and and, and kind of what we're starting to understand more broadly in, in the um, animal rights space and how that's kind of transitioning over. Some people, you know, my family who are not vegan or anything like that, they now understand what that term means. And that's a big step for them. And it's it's kind of that evolution where I, I, I think that fishes really fall under in terms of kind of accepting them as individuals. Um, now contrast that with farmed animal and farmed animal policy and the protections that are there or not there for farmed animals. Um, I think that's kind of where this conversation is probably going to lead, maybe not tonight, but at some point as to, you know, the, the more we understand that fishes are not just, um, you know, the bottom of the, the food chain, as I think Kimberly has, has you know, said before, um, that's my interest where, where, where I'm at today. Um, and I just want to thank everyone here on the panel who's helped us out with the um, the release that we did, the first investigation into caviar and the first real fish investigation in Canada, we're we're very proud of of the work that we've done. We think it came together uh, very well, and uh, I'm just honored to be amongst the uh, the giants in the field from both a philosophical and and scientific uh, standpoint. So, thanks. Amazing, Ben. Thank you. We're so glad to have you here. And you know what? Before we like jump in, I, I think you know there's been some uh, talk in the chat, and uh, and Jeremy said it would be great for someone to share the reasoning behind using fish's language versus fish for those who might be new to this sort of individual focus linguistic concept. And I think that's important because uh, that's one of the things I noticed right off the bat when I started promoting this is somebody, you know, people were like, your grammar is wrong. And so, um, Jonathan, I think you, you speak about this in your book. Um, would you mind giving just a little rundown of why linguistically many of us choose to use the word fishes? Sure. The word fishes is a legitimate word, it, but it's usually referring to more than one species. And when I was researching and writing what a fish knows, I thought, you know, I'd really like to make the case. I'm trying to make the case here that fishes are individuals, which they obviously are axiomatically, biologically, um, proverbial grains of sand, but these are sentient beings. And so um, I thought just the, the sort of the, the bland fish for individuals doesn't quite cut it. So I, I thought we should refer to them as fishes, which helps to help us think of them as individuals. So that was the rationale for that. Yeah. Anybody want to add add to that? Um, maybe one of the legal. Yes, Angela. Well, I was just going to say, I remember from Jonathan's book, also him making the point that the word fish is the same as like the verb, which is the killing of the fish. So if you're sort of trying to raise people's awareness about the ethical or legal, you know, uh, dimensions about that practice, maybe don't use the same word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah and, and in our work um, at Animal Justice, we're working really hard to get uh, animals moved out from the idea of being property <laughs> to actually be sentient, sentient individuals. And, and how do you do that when you're just referring to them as a monolith, like, you know, as a product? So, so the fishes is kind of the respectful way of recognizing that they're their own individual beings with their own personalities, their own likes, their own dislikes. Um, anybody else want to add anything I missed about that? Yeah, we got it. I think, I think we explained it. Okay, excellent. So um, when I was doing the research around the numbers uh, of, of fishes killed each day um, by humans worldwide, I, I, I mean, I had to shake my head. Uh, we're used to big numbers in animal advocacy, but one of the figures I found was 2.2 billion fishes killed each day by humans worldwide. Um, and, and as Ben said, you know, most of the population only thinks of them as the bottom of the food chain. And even the majority of animal advocates, we don't pay as much attention to fishes as say, um, pigs and chickens and, uh, animals in zoos and animals in labs. Um, so I want us to really help 
the folks that are here tonight to understand the reasons that we're doing this panel and why we should be advocating so hard for fishes. Um, so I, I really would love to start with Sofika. Sofika, um, what's what's one of the reasons? You don't need to cover all of them, but what's one of the big reasons like you're like, no, this is where I need to be. I need to be advocating for the fishes. Um, well, for me, this is this has been my entire career. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I've done so much around the individuals and trying to protect the habitats that they rely on and their biodiversity. So now really narrowing in on the individuals is so key to me because it's just opened up a whole new world of possibility and need for me. They really, they are individuals. They just don't happen to have vocal cords and lungs. So that's why humans are not relating to them. They happen to live below the water. And it's not just fishes. For me, it's all aquatic animals. So invertebrates, everything, right, in the sea. Um, millions upon millions of individual species. That's what's mind boggling. So the planet is covered 70% by water. Um, that's where biodiversity thrives is in these oceans. And we as humans completely rely on ocean health for our own survival. Every other breath comes from the ox or is supported by oxygen that's, you know, given to us by a healthy ocean. So um, we're, we're very foolish if we think that we exist in a vacuum. We're very foolish if we think we're above all this and we don't have to worry um, about the treatment of nature and the treatment of animals. That's why I do it. That's why I'll always continue to do it. Mm. Thank you, Sofika. Um, ben, what is, is what is the reason that you think we need to pay a lot more attention to fishes? Um, it, kind of exactly what Sofika said, but it, the scope and scale of the suffering um, that's endured by these trillions, right? These are numbers that we can't as humans uh, understand. Um, but the, this just the breadth of the suffering um, in both captivity and in the wild of of these fishes uh, who have quite literally no legal profession no legal protections whatsoever they don't even you know I, I remember you know maybe 20 years ago when it was almost you know we didn't think that chickens were back very intelligent and therefore it was easier to start slaughtering chickens right and 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 all that and then that grew the uh, chicken industry to what it is today which is just you know massive fish fishes are that but on a even larger greater scale with even less legal protections and i you know i think that's why conversations like this are important um but really uh, you know it's we we have a large um task ahead of us and uh i don't know let's 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 figure something out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ben, like, um, I think it was Sofika that said um, that fish is like, what the reason it's so hard to be able to put a number on how many are killed uh, every year is, is they're not counted as individuals that have right. died. They're counted in terms of tons, right? So, yeah, yeah so that's that just gives you, uh, you know, chickens uh, endure some of the worst treatment on this planet, but they are at least counted per per body, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just jump in really quickly? Yeah, um, just to put it in perspective, like mm. this is an extremely, extremely conservative estimate. And yeah. we know that the suffering of all land animals is horrific, an extremely conservative estimate of what's happening to aquatic animals. Um, at minimum, 35 times more individuals on an annual basis to all land based animals combined. And that number is skyrocketing because as people's diets and preferences begin to turn towards leaner forms of protein to you know moving away from terrestrial animals but still want you know wanting needing animal protein aquaculture is going through the roof in all jurisdictions around the world without exception and governments are heavily investing in it and subsidizing it that's why we need to care yes <laughs> Um, Jonathan, you, you know, I, I think you can probably speak to the fact that they're at the end of this sort of torturous, uh, existence are, are some feeling sentient individuals. Is that one of the biggest reasons you have for, for caring about fishes? Sure is. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're sentient individuals. They have cognition, awareness, emotions, 
social lives. I, I like to think of them as as individuals, not just with biologies, but with biographies. And we're in a scientific re renaissance now uh, where science is asking questions about what are animals thinking and feeling, questions that just a generation or two ago were, were kind of taboo in science. And so science is revealing that these animals are, fishes are full members of the vertebrate group. They they have all the, the, the body parts, but they also have the, the inner workings, uh, the experiences, different experiences, but the ability to experience things. They are sentient. They're, they're each unique individual. So what I do in my work and my writing is try to leverage that science into you know, for people to change their minds about things, they need information. And so the information is critical part of that process. Mm, thank you. Uh, Angela, what, what is your sort of mission, your push as far as why it's important to advocate for fishes? Well, I mean, I think it's some of the things that others have mentioned, like the numbers. Um, although, you know, I do find it's often very difficult to just kind of wrap your head around that the same way it is yeah. for land animals. Like you hear the number, it's sort of yeah. unclear what it means, you know. Um, but I really do think that if you, you know, like even if you just think of it from a basic utilitarian perspective of like quantity of suffering, we're talking about like a staggering level of suffering. And I think the fact that, you know, the fishes are living just sort of like, un, like where we're not, where we aren't, like and they're, they're in a different medium. And so we don't know them very well. So I think that's why like the education work is so important of like getting to know them and be able to relate to them. Because I think that is maybe ultimately what will kind of move people or shift people when numbers are, you know, sometimes just, just very hard to compute. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Chow, what about you? What what is what has drawn you to this area and why should we care so much? Yeah, I think that what you all mentioned before, that aquaculture is only going to be increasing. I think you mentioned this, Sofika, that aquaculture is totally skyrocketing. And what we know about aquaculture is that it's a new industry that really only took off in the past few decades or so. And while it adds to that sense of urgency, I think it also means that there's a lot of room for change to happen. Um, like Ben mentioned, guidelines aren't really determined yet. Consumer tastes haven't fully developed and the industry hasn't really matured and amassed the political power that we see in terrestrial agriculture. When we think big ag, we think cattle industry. Um, but with terrestrial agriculture, it's a behemoth with so much financial interest to continue the same system. And many people are currently employed in these systems doing the same thing they've been doing for decades. And I think that there's an opportunity here to prevent the aquaculture industry from continuing on this trend of eventually becoming you know, gaining the feedback loops that we see in terrestrial agriculture. And I think that we've seen success in this like prevention rather than a cure model. Um, ALI, like Aquatic Life Institute, so FICO, like secured like an incredible win in DC to ban octopus money. So I think these kinds mm -hmm. of proactive steps to prevent aquaculture from gaining an even stronger foothold will be really great so that, you know, we work on this now or it's going to be much tougher for us to work on it in the future, I think. Mm -hmm. Chow, that is, yeah, so, so important and actually gives me a lot more hope in this arena. It's, we're at the, we're sort of at the precipice of it, like yeah. really blowing up even more or being able to scale it back before, you know, before it's out of control. And, and you're right. So Fika, I mean, that the win that you had with um, the getting uh, octopus, the octopus farm in Spain, I believe it was canceled, right? Um, and can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, it's actually Washington State where we're oh. seeing something unbelievable. Well, it'll, it'll be a first of its kind when yeah. Governor Inslee signs it into law, um, which should happen in the next two days. But the Senate has passed it. The House has passed it. There's massive bipartisan support. And this is a preventative bill, a ban on any uh, pursuit of octopus farming in that jurisdiction. Um, because they see this as just a calamity waiting to happen. And of course, 
animal sentience is top of mind when we think of octopuses, which are the poster children of sentience and everything that's miraculous about aquatic animals. Hawaii has just introduced a bill quickly following suit. California has just introduced a bill um, in the last two weeks. And we just heard that um, Oregon is going to introduce it in 2025. So there is this like very, very critical um, momentum that's starting to build. Um, and we need to use that to ensure that industry cannot push through this most like egregious new proposal. There is a farm uh, that's been trying to be established in the Canary Islands uh, by a company out of Southern Spain for over 10 years. They've invested over 70 million euros in it, gone through many, many rigorous uh, permitting processes and just can't finish the job, which mm -hmm. tells you um, that there is a major problem. These are carnivores. They're highly solitary. They're venomous. There's a lot of effluent coming out of these farms. Um, there's a lot of biosecurity risks. We know octopuses are escape artists. Like, Let's not go there. Let's stop it before we unleash this new horror on animals and on our planet. And and Sophika, just so that I we're clear, um, do the like the problems with them getting this uh, this enterprise uh, launched? Has it just been about technical things, or or is has it been that huge international public push that's also affected it? The huge international push has come very recently, sort of in the last two years, um, but this farm has been trying to be established for 10 years now. So there have been investment challenges and there have been permit clearing challenges, but more so than anything else, they haven't figured out how to rear octopuses in captivity because they're so complicated and there are no humane slaughter methods. This is an animal that has nine brains or like uh, neuron centers. It has three hearts. The arms can operate independently after being severed from the body for up to an hour, continue tasting and smelling and changing color. So we, we don't even know what we're dealing with here. That's why it hasn't gone through yet. We're we're dealing with superior aliens, obviously. So <laughs> I mean we That's all know what that. I believe. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> just, just so we're clear. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and Kimberly, like I'll just add like I, we in Canada we have the petition against octopus farming as well like just to be you know thinking along the same lines like what what Chad was saying which is stop it before it gets established because then you don't have to disinvest people you which is much much harder to do yeah amazing thank you um so all of this in mind folks um the the sentience the incredible trillions that we're talking about why are people so apathetic about the plight of fishes? Let's let's dissect it. Let's let's bring it down to what's actually happening here. Um, what does most of the world have wrong about fishes, and what's the truth? Okay, I, I want to hear what your sort of what you, are some of your biggest pet peeves about what people you know think fishes are all about, and 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 let's correct the record right here. Um, so, um, Chow, how about we start with you. Her. I think my biggest pet peeve actually is that sometimes you'll hear, even within the movement, you'll hear folks calling fish our ancestors. How Have you heard that before? I've definitely yeah. heard it. Uh -huh. um, and I think that's where this idea that they're primitive comes from, but that's just completely wrong. They have spent just as much time evolving as we, we both share this earth at this moment in time. It's not that they've gone extinct 40 million years ago, we're here together right now. So we share an ancestor, but that doesn't mean that they are our ancestor. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They've been, they've been evolving far longer than we have. So amazing. Thank you, Chow. Um, uh, ben, how about you? What's, what's something that you think people ha have got wrong about fishes? Um, for me, I think that the most obvious one is that we used to think that they didn't even feel pain, right? Let, let alone even recognize other species, recognize humans, but the, just, just the broad, broad stroke that someone decided one day, oh, they don't feel pain, right? Um, that's obviously been, uh, disproven at length. Um, so to me, it's, it's that and, and kind of drawing on what Chow said too, um, they're, they've always been treated as the other, 
they 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 don't have lungs that breathe oxygen like other terrestrial animals. That's weird to us. For some for some reason, we want everything to look like us and, and act like us. Yeah. And the fact that they can breathe underwater, that's just weird. And and to me, that becomes another instance of it's a lot easier to uh, denigrate the other um, in in society and and whatever. Um, and so for me, it's those two things, just kind of the other, and it they don't feel pain. Yeah, oh, it's a huge one. The the fish don't f don't feel pain. I've heard it's from so many people and who I thought were quite intelligent, and it's it is very a very far um you know far flung sort of not far flung. It's just goes a lot of places and from a lot of parts of the globe, and um and the other thing that you were saying um. Ben, uh, so you were saying, yeah, that we can't identify with them, um, you know, and and this we're kind of going up against biology here a little bit, you know, as as humans, we we tend to um, migrate towards uh, beings that we can really identify with. It's a little harder to identify with a being that has scales and fins and it, you know, and all that sort of thing. So, um, Jonathan, what, what's one of the things that you um, have experienced that you want to set the record straight? with well so first of all i mean they're out of sight out of mind right they, they have the disadvantage of evolving and living in a in a part of the planet a habitat that's below our visual field we we now with scuba and underwater cinematography we 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 have tools to bring to light their complexity but um th those are terrible disadvantages for fishes and and while they don't have vocal cords to say things they actually do make a lot of different sounds if we tune in with um underwater hearing equipment which we can also do we find that they actually use different parts of their bodies their swim bladders their teeth their bones rubbing against each other and they make lots of sounds uh, that's just one example of, of many aspects of their lives that I feel like if we could we could bring it more to light and make people more aware of it, it would it would help to make, give us more sympathy towards their plight. Mm, yeah. So I mean, what about this idea that they um, that they have no personalities, like they're just like automatrons, basically? What? what? For sure. I mean, certainly the science shows that they have individual recognition. Um, they have lifelong showmates, uh, I like to call them, and uh, they can, they, they, there's aspects of their recognition that are a bit like us. Uh, most fishes don't seem to be able to recognize a familiar individual whose face is upside down. Scientists can present them with cues like that. That's called the face inversion effect. We have that too, and I think it maybe it's a it's a tool for generating sympathy and empathy for another animal to show that they have phenomena that are similar to us another one i like to talk about is um, optical illusions you train a fish to poke their nose against the larger two circles and then you present them with the ebbinghaus illusion which is two orange circles or pick your color surrounded by blue dots of different size. It makes them look very, it's a really powerful optical illusion. One dot looks bigger than the other. And a trained fish will go when presented with this and poke the larger two dots to get a little food reward. A rodent, a robot, uh, a rodent would have trouble with that, but a robot uh, wouldn't. A robot could just measure, see that they're the same size, see that they're the same size. I'm not arguing that ro robots are sentient anytime soon, uh, <laughs> but, but they wouldn't be fooled by that. Uh, because robots are not are not products of evolution. They're not individual beings. They they're automatons. Automatons. Fishes are not. They're fallible. They have have beliefs, and those beliefs can be wrong. And I think that too is a very human like attribute. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Sofika. What's what's something that uh, you feel like the world gets wrong about fishes? Yeah, absolutely. Ch uh, Chiao, did you want to jump in? Yeah, sorry. Before I go. Oh, sorry. Okay. I didn't see that. I, I just Sophika, saw you're you're watching closer up. than I am. Yes, ciao. Please, <laughs> please build on that. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that too. The um I have the incredible pleasure of getting to know some koi fish in a community garden here at Brooklyn. And they have been with us for 10, 20 years. They're incredible beings. And I have been able to develop a play routine with them. They'll come out for pets. And they will only let you pet them if they know you get if they get to know you for a little bit longer. And there's this one particular goldfish that will let me play the zoomies with them. Like they'll come up to my hand and I'll like zoom them through the water and they'll come around and do it all over again. So they have like just they experience joy and they will come back looking for it. Fish do zoomies. I mean, come on. Absolutely. <laughs>
Wow. Um, Sofika. Yeah. Um, it's, it's about fishing. So I think people have it completely wrong when they say this fish is a good fighter or this and that. The reason that it is flopping around and fighting is because it is an incredible distress. <laughs> it is being hooked. It is being speared. It is being whatever it is being. That is a very clear signal that what we're doing to it is troubling it, is causing its cortisone levels to go, cortisol levels like through the roof. This is not entertainment. Also, when fish are brought out of water, they're not just flopping around. They are literally asphyxiating before our eyes. It is the opposite, uh, but same of throwing us in the water where we can't breathe and we would die, of course, um, a very uncomfortable and not extremely quick death. So they are asphyxiating in front of our eyes when they're flopping around. We just can't hear them expressing that that's yeah. what people have wrong yeah and and i don't think there is any other uh sport hunting where there is such delight taken in that part of it in the in the let's bring them into their death and let's watch them flop around and laugh at them you know it's it's just a degree such a degree of desensitization yeah, like the big sport fish, right? So yeah. marlin and sailfish, these magnificent animals, uh, bluefin tuna, that's not sport fishing. Um, but they will literally be dragged behind boats for hours until they are completely exhausted, completely depleted. And even if they are, you know, weighed and then released, the post-release mortality on those animals is well over 50% because they're completely damaged. They can't um, fend for themselves. And they're obviously injured from whatever mechanism the hook uh, was pulling them through the water. Mm, thank you, Sofika. Somebody just asked about the catch and release. So I'm so, so glad you addressed that. Um, Angela, what oh, do yeah, people I, uh, yeah, get wrong? Yeah, I was wrong? just going to add to that, you know, this, this, you know, that we're not hearing them because, you know, they don't have lungs and, but that's, that's, but if they did have lungs, we would hear them. And I think people would be much more moved than they are. Mm -hmm. um, but to the point about like the fighting, um, Sofika that you're talking about, um, the scholar Danish Wadiwell, he has this great article called um, Do Fish Resist? Where he tries to get people to sort of see that that fighting is actually like, can be interpreted you know, not just as suffering, but also as a political act of resistance. And I think that, you know, for the folks who are here listening to this, I think that's quite helpful because it sort of helps you bridge the the gap to, you know, like if you're an animal activist and you're caring about all, all the sentience, then you want to be assisting in some way that you can, you know, all of us are different. We're all differently situated in the world. We have different positions and roles and so on. But insofar as you are able to help with that resistance, Thank you, Angela. Um, you know, we started to kind of uh, uh, go into this territory, but um, I'm going to sort of put forth that that sharing a little bit more about the magnificence of, of fishes, the personality of fishes, the depth of feeling, uh, the intelligence of, of fishes um, is, is a really amazingly powerful form of act uh, advocating for fishes. Um, I, would you agree that that, that is part of, part, you know, a bit really strong part of that? Um, so what I'd love to do is, is I'd love, love for, for you all to um, tell us something you know about uh, fishes, a species of a fish, or an experience you've had with a fish, kind of like what Chow did, that you feel would change people's thinking about the capacity of fishes. And, and we do this, uh, you know, I really want our community to listen to these stories, because these are stories, like the one Chow just, uh, you know, told, that can be used in a conversation with somebody when they say, oh, well, you know, fishes are, they don't, they've got five second memory. They don't think, you know, they don't, they, they don't feel anything. These are the stories that you need to put in your back pocket. So um, Jonathan, let's start with you. 
Sure. One of my favorites is a cooperative hunting between two predatory species of fishes on reefs. Groupers, coral groupers, other types of groupers will team up with moray eels to, to hunt together. And groupers are f fishes of the open reef water uh, and moray eels are like ferrets of the sea, if you like. They can go into nooks and crannies. So by working collaboratively, they they catch a lot more prey. Uh, sometimes people ask me, do they share it? Well, they don't share it literally where they break it in half and each has half. But by working together over time, they know because they, they choose their partners they know that they're going to have a higher success rate and, and observational studies have shown it's up to five times greater success rate. But uh, there are other aspects to this relationship that are that show the individuality, the awareness, the complexity of these fishes because the grouper actually does a, a gesture, does a head shake, swims to their favorite moray eel lair. And if the moray eel's there, the, the fish does a little head shake. And you can watch YouTube videos of this, and that's the moray eel's way of inviting the grouper. Uh, the sorry, that's the grouper's way of inviting the moray eel. So if they're in the mood, uh, off they go together. They look like a couple of Disney characters. And um, pointing is another thing that groupers will do. If a grouper finds a fish who's fled into the matrix of the reef, and the, when the moray eel's over there, the grouper, in hoping to get them over here where they can pursue it, they will swim up, nose down, pointing to the spot. They, they'll do that for up to 23 minutes, much more patient than most studies of humans show when food's in the offing. Uh, and they'll swim over to literally get the moray eel to, to sort of usher them back, shepherd them over to where this fish is hiding. So that those are called referential gestures because the particularly like the head shake, it's referring to something that's going to be happening in a different time frame later and at a different location. Hence the word referential. And I can tell you, scientists are impressed by referential communication. It's not widespread in animals. Fishes aren't don't just do some cool things. They do. They're right up there. In, in some cases, I mean, there's over over thirty three thousand known species. So what applies to one doesn't necessarily apply to to some of the others. But if we delved deeply into the the, the biology of every fish, we would find fantastic aspects of all of the all all species. Mm, thank you, Jonathan. And yes, I have seen this uh, YouTube videos of this, and it's incredible. Like a cross species cooperation, uh, again, better than humans for the most part. Um, uh, Angela, do you have, uh, like tell us about as far as as some of your observations? Uh, yeah, you know, I feel like um, you know, probably like I don't know fishes you know, as in the same kind of detail um, as others. Yeah, well, you're a lawyer. You don't necessarily get scuba diving that often, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but, you know, I do think that, like, I feel like the intelligence stories are so interesting and they're so, and Jonathan has so many of them in his book and you just go, wow. Like, so that's just like us, right? That's our limitations. And, and so I think for some people learning about that's going to be very moving for them. But I also think, you know, sort of like just looking at Safika and your background, Safika, like, I think also there's, there's an aspect of just sort of like the beauty and the awe that like, you know, we, we should just have for like other like sentient creatures who are obviously so cool. And, you know, not necessarily that they have to prove that they're smart for us to respect them. Like, why do they mm -hmm. have to be smart for us to respect them? Like, yeah. why, why can't we just sort of be that way oriented towards them and I know that uh, that's often not going to work enough for people but in a way it really should it should absolutely it absolutely should um it's not you know the famous quote it's not about um uh do they think uh do they feel it's do they suffer and and so um but you know in terms of advocacy we're we're looking at a different thing. We're looking at trying to change the mind and the and the position, you know, positioning of so many people that aren't, you know, that just don't feel compassion in this area. So so it's really good for us to maintain and recognize, yeah, like when we speak in terms of intelligence, first of all, we're talking in terms of human intelligence, which, you know, is very that's a very limiting way. Um, but it's also important to recognize that yes, we know that on one hand. And on the other hand, we've got to find ways to break through uh like what I call this uh, this wall of uh, uh of, of not caring. Um so uh Sofika. Give us a give us a little little, little taste little story of, of something that has really affected you. Yeah, um, I, I will. And this one popped immediately to my mind. But just to Angela's point first, I mean, some of the greatest attractions in cities around the world are aquariums. People love going to aquariums, you know, animals yeah. in captivity, that is an issue. Um, 
But most of the like most prominent marine biologists on the planet <laughs> got their start like going to aquariums, experiencing animals up close that they otherwise wouldn't be able to see. So there's there's something there. It's totally true about the power of connection and just that starts the relatability to this species that is so, or, you know, gr groups of species that are so mysterious. So for me, um, so I just want to say that, but the story that popped immediately to my mind is um, probably like 20 years ago or something. Um, I was down in the Cayman Islands scuba diving, and there's a very famous spot there called Tarpon Alley. Now, tarpons are these kind of prehistoric looking gigantic fish. They're heavily, heavily armored. They're sleek like torpedoes. They're incredibly powerful. They're, you know, five to six feet long. They're, they're bigger than I am. They're heavier than I am. Anyways, so you drop down into this narrow gully and the tarpons swim around you. Um, so I went down with my friend, Scott, and um, we saw a few sort of like off in the distance and we decided to try to go a little closer. So we started finning towards them and then you could tell that they registered that we were in their territory. <laughs> and they are unbelievably territorial, which I learned after the fact or during this experience. One of them um, was obviously incredibly irritated that we were in their space. It, it, I've never seen anything move so quickly in my life. And it just flew straight at us, straight at my face. And I was helpless. I was horrified. I was completely frozen in space. And I was completely out of my element. This animal was very dominant. Um, luckily for me, the tarpon swam and stopped maybe one to two feet away from my mask, completely, you know, from full tilt to full stop, stared at me into my eyes through my mask and then swam away. It was like, you're not interesting. <laughs> you're not a threat, <laughs> but it could have done some unbelievable damage. Mm -hmm. And that just really stuck with me that, you know, there's, there's turf wars, there's territory, there's, you know, a dominance, a hierarchy, um, just uh, the, the power and the majesty of these individuals. Um, yeah, that, that one mm -hmm. just really jumped out at me. I, I had never had an experience like that with an aquatic animal. They were ready for a throwdown, Safika. Oh, they would have. They would have. <laughs> and won. then they were like, "Oh no, she's backing away." <laughs> they would have won. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Chow, how about you? I, you you told us about the koi fishes. Um, that's amazing, and I'm sure you've got many stories in your in your back pocket. Yeah, I. If it's possible, can I talk about a non-fish aquatic animal? Sure. Go for it. Uh, yeah, so I would love to sort of bring attention to crustaceans. They we don't talk about them as much, but they're definitely a very common animal that we like to farm in aquaculture. That it's very common. Uh, but something that people don't really know about them is that they have incredible parental care behaviors. So, for instance, the red swamp crayfish will spend three to four months. Caring for their young, they'll fan them, they'll feed them, they'll clean them, they'll do all these incredible behaviors to take care of their babies. And this goes across the board for most crustaceans, like shrimp and lobster have these incredible behaviors of protecting their young. And so for the red swamp crayfish, the maternal females will actually like stand up when their young have sort of gone off, they're gone exploring, but if she sees a threat, she'll stand up and reveal her pleopods, which are the little feet that they use for swimming to as a way to call them back home. And then her young will like, return when they see that. So they, and this is a, a position that's like a little bit vulnerable. So usually they wouldn't really do that unless they really had to, but that's something that they do to like sort of as a way to communicate to their young to come back to the mother. So I think it's just an incredible thing that we don't think about when we, when people consume crustaceans that they have this incredible way of caring for the children. Hmm. 
that makes that breaks my heart even more with seeing uh, what we do to crustaceans and, and but thank you chow so important and such a beautiful um such a beautiful picture to hold and to communicate to others mm. ben i want you to tell us about um a particular fish that has figured very prominently in our investigation can you tell us about gracie Sure. So, um, in, in in somewhat similar to to Chow's first first story about the koi here, um, so Gracie uh, it was on or is on the sturgeon farm. Uh, she is a forty year old vir- uh, sturgeon, not virgin, um, and she uh, was originally brought to the farm when it first started in nineteen ninety nine. Um, she is seven feet tall. Um, long. And uh, Gracie kind of stands out amongst all the other uh, fishes there because she is the oldest. She's very noticeable. She's a little bit lighter than the other fish. The other fish kind of revere her. She's kind of the the, the queen. Um, and what's interesting is that some of the employees there noted that after a while, once Gracie starts getting comfortable um, with people working there, she would come up and always see what's going on, very curious, making sure that everything is in order, everything's in line, um, everything's going you know, uh, as it should. And um, if she liked you, she would come up and let you um, pet her. Um, and this is a fish who's been in captivity the entirety of her life. You know, She has a lifespan of maybe 60, 70 years. Um, and she's never been uh, outside of captivity, and yet she's still exhibiting these extremely, um, you know, uh, curious tendencies. I- intelligence on any metric you want it, you want to put on it, she is an intelligent being. And so, um, Gracie's, you know, became kind of a, a, a focus on on our investigation, and just breaks my heart that she's uh, she's there. And and not just there, but there in a small little dirty pool that she's been swimming around in for at least 25 years in the, at this this place. So, um, folks, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the investigation, um, but I, I want to give you a little, um, a, a, like a little look at it. Um, we did a short documentary about this. I'm just going to show you a couple of minutes, um, the first couple of minutes. And uh, just to give you a sense of this, because um, we haven't really gotten too much into fish farms, which again, also called aquaculture by the industry. And I think um, this is a really important piece that uh, we also have to uh, be really aware of as uh, people advocating for fishes is um, the fish farms, which are hell on earth <laughs> um, for fishes. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is is I'm going to play this uh, just a couple of minutes. Like I said, uh, there uh, the first couple of minutes are pretty um, Uh, are a little tamer. We try not to get too graphic, um, but if you are sensitive, you may want to close your eyes and listen, but I really recommend that you at least listen. Um, What they endure with their bodies, we should at least be able to endure with one of our senses. So um, just give me two seconds while I share screen. And like I said, we'll just do a couple of minutes of this. Caviar one of the world's most elite foods. Costing thousands of dollars per pound, it's a delicacy for the ultra-rich. In Canada's first ever undercover investigation into the world of fish farming, animal justice is exposing the horrifying secrets of the caviar industry. Caviar has been criticized and even banned in some places for its extreme impact on wild sturgeon populations. But until now, the world hasn't seen inside a caviar farm without the filter of decadent marketing. What our whistleblower found inside this British Columbia caviar farm surprised us. Here we have the sucking of the eggs out from the hole after the hole is punctured into the fish's belly, I think. Like, you'll see the water in here. It's not Yeah, I mean, we didn't have it and it was like, it's gone. We just are not talking about the fish so much. As my understanding is that there just really aren't very many protections. Practice is so new that we just don't have 
good guidance. Based on our work, caviar farms are much less transparent than what we've seen in other places. No one really knows what's going on. Not only is caviar an unnecessary indulgence that most people don't eat, it's exceptionally cruel to animals, similar to other status symbol foods that cause immense suffering. Watch as we show that caviar, like other luxury animal products, is just too cruel to be sold. This is Gracie. Gracie is a 30-something-year-old, seven-foot-long sturgeon who's been living in a tank like this since at least 1999. She lives at Northern Divine Aqua Farms, a white sturgeon and coho salmon caviar farm on BC's Sunshine Coast. One worker claimed Gracie's parents were born in the Fraser River and she was born in captivity. She spends her day swimming in circles in her filthy tank. So that was the beginning. Um, Ben, why don't you lay the groundwork? We're gonna we'll just talk a little bit more about this investigation and what we are what we can do about this because this is a moment in time where we actually animal advocates can take um, some steps. But but let's just have you sort of start it. Um, can you uh, just lay the groundwork? Um, sure. And so we had an individual go um, work at a caviar farm um, in Seychelles, BC. Um, they didn't do just caviar. They also um, sold uh, roe, um, which is, uh, of course, uh, salmon eggs and coho salmon for meat. Um, so they had a kind of a number of different um, revenue uh, generators, as they would probably call it. Um, and you know, the first thing that this individual remarked to us when we spoke to them was just the general, um, you know, just the water was always dirty, the oxygen levels were always low, um, and it just was not a place that you would um, want your food, whatever your diet is, to come from. Um, and within that, there was just um, clearly a number of fish in distress. The sturgeons were overcrowded. Um, and, you know, it was just kind of a, a, a horrific, um, it, it, similar to what we see in most other factory farms, um, it very much was operating in a similar fashion as those. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Jonathan, you uh, took a, a really good look at this investigation, um, and you were, and we started to see the clip. Can you explain what the thing is with the straw and the sucking out? Can you explain what was happening there? Because that was something that I never thought I'd see. Yeah, I'd never heard of it myself. Uh, as far as I could tell from the film and the descriptions, um, they they stab a, a device into the, hopefully into the area where the eggs are. I say hopefully because there's a risk of puncturing a swim bladder and other parts of the fishes, neighboring organs, etc. And then in the it's very crude uh, with a piece of rubber tubing, you can get that at a, any hardware store. They they simply insert that into the hole left by the the knife or whatever device it was they stabbed with. And then uh, sucked out the a few eggs as a sample to gauge the level of maturity of the eggs as when when they'd be suitable for extraction on as a whole on mass. So that's as I understood it. I mean, when we're talking about this filthy brown water that they're in. This is taking place in in that kind of water, and you you got to figure it's not a very sterile medical procedure that they're doing. Uh, that's just another layer of concern. Um, so the animal's pain and the and the wholesomeness of the product uh, both come into question there a lot. Mm, yeah, and uh, and this is a procedure that you know it, it's like doing a C-section on like what uh, the equivalent of doing a C-section on a human woman. Uh, they're doing it over and over and over again on these fishes to check to see if the eggs are ready so they can slaughter them, slice them open and take all the eggs. And of it's, course, no local anesthesia either. No, no, absolutely not. Um, what about the rest of you? Anybody else want to share something about the investigation that you that really hit you? Angela? 
Well, you know, I have to say, like, it's hard to know where to start, Kimberly. Like, there were mm -hmm. just so many things in there that I just was like, what, what, what? And that's, you know, part of what I think is so valuable about what animal justice has done here, because really, like, I'm sure other people are very similarly situated in terms of, like, just not knowing about this at all and not understanding, okay, like, these are the things that are involved. And also for a product that, like, you know, it's like such an unnecessary food item. Like it's just ridiculous. And the core, the correlation between like what you're doing and the level of cruelty. And it's just like, oh my goodness, like you could, it feels like the type of thing you could convince people to get rid of and not do both based on how attached they would be to the, to that product, but also based on like what is happening in order to obtain it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the thing is, a lot of people will also say, well, I don't need caviar, but it's really important to, uh, we didn't get to this part, but this facility also um, does coho salmon eggs, which are often used in sushi. So as ikura. So um, it's, you know, this is an important thing. If anybody knows anybody that eats sushi, um, they're probably going to see these eggs on, on the sushi. And it's just it's just a garnish, right? Um, so, so right. Um, Chow, is there anything that you want to uh, mention about what you saw and about this practice? Um, I think I would just really echo Angela. I think the whole video is awful. I think that every single thing that they're doing there is really terrible. And I mean, I guess one thing in particular is that like, this is an aquaculture system and it's supposed to be supposed to be devised as a solution, as a clean path forward away from wild caught fisheries. And yet like, look how awful it is. I mean, the water was so murky in that enclosure and in an aquaculture system, it's in totally enclosed. So there's no mud, there's no sand in the water. That's absolutely just feces and bacteria happening. Like that is such just a clear case of negligence me I think it's there's no excuse for them. thank you Chow um so Fika can you speak a little bit more about this sort of movement to fish farms as the big solution can you tell us a little bit about that yeah I can and actually I, I know that some uh sturgeon operations they actually conduct surgeries on the animals on the pregnant females remove the leg uh the eggs stitch them back up and put them back in the water for the next egg cycle to be ready. So, so there's um, different approaches mm -hmm. to harvesting multiple, uh, I guess, multiple batches of caviar from, from a single female. Um, yes, so aquaculture is absolutely on the rise um, globally, as I had mentioned. It's becoming more accessible. Um, but it's been around for three to 4,000 years. Like the practice of farming aquatic animals has been around for a very, very long time. But it was, you know, up until, as people were saying, probably 30 or 40 years ago, typically like local small scale farms, vegetarian species, people have like a pond in their backyard and they would feed their family or their immediate community. And that's still unbelievably prevalent around the world. And a lot of the time, it is the only form of protein that um, people have access to. So in our work, we typically focus on industrial scale, commercial aquaculture, um, and fishing practices and, and reforming those and, and creating immediate interventions from a, from a welfare perspective. Um, aquaculture is very broad ranging, though, because you can be uh, farming something from kelp and algae and clams and oysters all the way up to bluefin tuna. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a huge, huge diversity in, in that space itself, Some, somewhere around 100 or so uh, species of aquatic animals are farmed around the world right now at commercial scale. So huge mm -hmm. diversity, there's vegetarian species, there's um, carnivorous species. So the carnivores are the, you know, the tuna, the salmon, the uh, shrimp are carnivorous, um, trout and so on. 
so there's kind of a scale of um, suffering associated even in that spectrum. When we're farming carnivores, you have to feed them other fish. And there's all these hidden costs and hidden losses to other animals because you're catching anchovies, herrings, sardines, the small fish, grinding them up into fish meal, fish oil, feeding them to the large carnivores. But those large carnivorous high-end fish are not feeding a hungry world. They're ending up at Costco. They're ending up on your dinner plate in a restaurant. So it's, it's, it's magnifying the scale of the problem and the scale of the suffering. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, th- I think that it's really important also for us, even though it's really difficult, I think, in the um, kind of animal, animal rights space, but to recognize that there is incredible diversity globally, and we just can't afford to take a global north approach either and say, mm-hmm. because I have you know, the the luxury and the privilege of choosing not to eat, you know, fish, aquatic animals, that everyone in the world has to do that today. Because for, for a significant proportion of the global population, it's just not, like, they, they are nutrient poor. They, there is food scarcity. Um, so so it's, it's very complex when you start digging into it. But the practice of commercial scale industrial agriculture or aquaculture that's being heavily um, supported and, um, and funded by governments globally. And, you know, there's all these hidden costs. That's a problem. That's a problem. The suffering is enormous. Um, the waste in the system is something like 50% of all Um, aquatic animal protein is wasted, whether it's through spoilage in um, grocery stores, spoilage in restaurants, losses throughout the processing system, bycatch just gets thrown back in the ocean, um, never even makes its way to markets. So there's just all like, it's just riddled, riddled, riddled with problems. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, So how to start tackling this. I think it's really important for um, legislators to start understanding that subsidies for these massive industries are not um, not the solution at all. We need to refocus people's diets and preferences on, you know, leapfrogging over the um, aquatic animal protein space and going to plants, Mm -hmm. (laughs) going to alternative proteins, going to cultivated product. um, That's where the investments need to happen. We don't have the luxury of time from a climate perspective, from a sustainability perspective, and certainly not from an animal suffering perspective to say, and now we're going to, you know, massively expand this industry and eventually we'll deal with it Mm -hmm. decades and decades later, if not, you know, if never. Yeah. And, and, and that has been, it's, you know, it went from overfishing to let's do um, uh, a net based, you know, uh, fish farms. And then there was pushback on that. Now they're trying to move it all, you know, inland um, and, and where we have all of these animal welfare problems as well and potential environmental problems. Um, and so, yeah, so, so we are sort of working to be able to go after the big, uh, the big commercial industries um, to be able to um, also work on a individual level of we don't need to eat, you know, um, uh, animal protein to survive. We can be very healthy on a plant-based diet. Um, So anyway, before we go into some more strategy, because that was a beautiful start to the strategic talk, um, Sofika, I just want to, because a lot of you are like, really shaken by this investigation and there are ways that you can absolutely help. So first of all, We just put out the video yesterday um, and we would love if everybody on this uh, in this gathering shared on one of the social media platforms, it would make a huge uh, difference. So Kirsten's going to put the links in the uh, chat and you can just sort of copy and paste um, for whatever social media platforms you're on. Um, Go after this and share it uh, and make a, you know, do a little uh, caption above that says why you care about this. What did you learn tonight that you want to share with the world? 
world. Um, and uh, if you don't have social media, email email this video to some people that you think would be able to um, would 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 be affected by this. And um, and one last thing, uh, we have an action page. Um, we're asking you to sign the action page, which will have an email sent to uh, some of the top ministers in the Canadian government to ban caviar, uh, including the Minister of Fisheries, our uh, climate, um, or sorry, environmental minister, and of course, our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. Um, so please, if you haven't already, um, Kirsten, and uh, Kirsten, if she hasn't already, we'll put it into the chat and you can do that while you're talking to us. Uh, while we're while we're doing uh, this panel, please get in there and uh, and sign. And and folks, AJers um, who have worked with us for a while, you know that even a form E letter can be much more powerful if you change the subject line and change the body of the email up a little bit. That can make it far more um, powerful. So if you can just do a little rejigging, um, that would be great. Um, okay, so let's talk. We've got a few more minutes left, and I want to talk more strategy. Okay, so first of all, let's talk messaging. What are uh, some of the messaging pieces that we really need to um, think about? Okay, like. Um, how, first of all, I'm going to throw this out and, and I'd love for anybody to answer, but how do we communicate the scale of fish is killed in a way that people can actually grasp? Because when I heard the whatever three trillion and I'm like, that's 3000 billion. How do we say this in a way that people will understand? Anybody want to jump in with this one? Jonathan. Sure. In my book about fishes, I, I um, did some calculations crude, but took the average size of an average fish if it was the length of a dollar bill. And then based on the numbers and some number crunching, you could line them up end to end and it would reach the sun and back. Don't let them say moon. The moon is close, but the sun is 93 million miles and back with still a, a couple of hundred billion to spare. Again, that it's, it's and that's easy how many get killed every year, Jonathan. Yeah, that's based on that's based on the trillion measure by fish count, I think was the organization that came up with that. Wow. under two trillion or so wow um what about other messaging folks um like for example um what seems to be um let's talk a little bit more about language we talked about the idea of fishes versus fish but what about uh, uh, using the word seafood like that should be a no-no right we should always be taught saying uh sea life marine life uh, tell me a little bit more about that anybody else want to talk about that Ch uh, Chow? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Chow. Uh, yeah, I, maybe I could jump in here. I totally agree that the term seafood is incredibly harmful. I think that it causes people to think that fish are just this one homogenous thing. They have fins and they're all the same. But that's totally untrue. And I think we can see that because uh, one thing that Becca and I are working on in the lab, we found that 56 new species of aquatic animals were farmed for the first time. So people are trying to farm new, new, new species of aquatic animals, new fish, crustaceans in 2021 alone. And so people are really thinking that they know how to farm one species of fish, they know how to farm all of them. And if we think about that for terrestrial animals, it's the equivalent of a cow farmer thinking they know how to farm pigs just because they have four legs. But they're totally different beings with different lives. And so I share this fact because I think bringing into relief who these animals are and what their stories would really help. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this, the, the documentary on Netflix, My Octopus Teacher. I think that it really showed that people don't gravitate to like, hey, this animal is suffering. Look at the scale. But I think people gravitate to moving stories that like elevate who these animals are. Like we've known since day one that cows and pigs suffer, but in like we so can a lot of humans will continue to eat them. So I think, you know, just showing like like showing things that move people in a deep and profound way would really help. And we have so many stories to tell about these animals. Like, look how they care for the young. Look how they collaborate to solve problems. Look, they will play zoomies with you. I think that could really sort of like shift the narrative from something that's like negative that people like kind of disengage from. Or like they'll forget about it after the shock value, but like something that really moves, them, like, you know, change hearts and minds, I guess. Yeah. So you feel like a key is getting people to connect to the individuals, getting them to connect 
to the commonalities that we have yeah. with, with these animals. Um, what about, um, you know, just other themes and approaches that seem to be breaking through? Um, uh, you know, for example, is is the environmental angle, you know, just is that a, Sophika, you're nodding your head. Is yeah. that a big one? That's, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Anyone who's in industry, anyone who's in this policy space, anyone who's not, you know, in the animal rights, animal justice space, responds to not animal sentience in fact they think that is super weird and they don't even know what to do with it but it's very important to know your audience and speak your audience's language where we have had tremendous success speaking with policymakers and corporations is talking global sdgs sustainable development goals talking climate implications talking sustainability talking labor issues and these are all intersectional they all totally relate to animal welfare it's just a different way of thinking about it um and animal rights as well so i'm, I'm kind of lumping the two together and i know for for a lot of people that's a trigger point so maybe that's a, a topic for a future <laughs> animal justice academy conversation yeah yeah but absolutely. our ultimate vision of course is to stop our reliance on animals <laughs> but mm -hmm. from a welfare perspective it's immediate interventions to stop the suffering so mm -hmm. th that that's just my pitch but yes using different language that those key decision makers that hold a lot of power can relate to is critical and i'm sorry but it's not welfare well-being sentience mm -hmm. no that that'll take a long time to um to socialize mm -hmm. and you know uh, so for the general public we're, we're thinking well especially you're dealing with the uh, corporate world too um for the general population you're thinking environmental is 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 the trojan horse um you know we also have work to do just convincing animal advocates to put fishes <laughs> on their priority list. So, you know, and, and in terms of that, then sentience probably is an important piece to, to relate to sentience and the scale of suffering. Um, anybody else have uh, uh, approaches, um, uh, you know, little things that seem to be moving the needle um, from what you've seen? Well, I would say, you know, to build on what Chow was talking about a moment ago, like about, you know, just the kind of like, you know, like we were talking earlier, the beauty or the awe. And I feel like in the future, you know, like when Safika was talking about aquarium and visiting them, and I, I think probably pretty soon we're going to be at a point where kids are going to be able to have that experience in like an immersive AI kind of context, which will be like more up close even than anything you could replicate with live animals. And so I think that when that happens, that will be a really big um, game changer for this. Um, you know, people will still really enjoy doing that with their children and, you know, but you can do it in an environment where like the animals aren't actually being being used or, or confined. Um, but I would also echo what Chow was saying about the, uh, my octopus teacher. Like I know when Senate, when we've been talking about these different bills for whales and dolphins and now elephants and, and big apes, and the senators are often talking about like documentaries like Blackfish and my octopus teacher, and it's teaching us that we need to respect animals because we're all connected and so on and so forth. So I, I feel like you know, it's, it's, it sort of seems to me like it's happening at, at all different levels, including those very high levels. And um, like, that's, I think that's super, that's super promising. It's, it's, it's great, great to see. Mm, Jamie Woodhouse in the chat said, we need a film that genuinely tries to take the perspective of a fish, like a uh, cow or gunda or stray uh, do for uh, cows, pigs, and dogs. So that's anybody that's uh, into film there, there's, there's a challenge. Um, I, I, I think that's a really amazing idea. Um, Saving John Nemo. Yes. Say, finding oh, Nemo. Yes, there Nemo. is Finding Nemo. Yes, yes, yes exactly. <laughs> yeah. Speaking, it's, speaking of Finding Nemo, uh, let's have a lot of materials tailored to the younger audiences. They're tomorrow's leaders. They have more stake in the health, future health of the planet than any other demographic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, books, children's books, speaking at schools, films that are geared 
uh, tailored the content and the style, the presentation tailored to children. I think those are really important elements as well. Yeah, because there's just so much programming that, you know, we grow up with around fishes. And so, you know, starting starting early, as with every animal advocacy, but it seems especially important here. Um, what about bogus, uh, all these certifications that make people feel comfortable uh, buying fishes? Uh, you know, is there, do you think there's a pathway in, in, um, uh, really sort of blowing those up a little bit. Anybody have a, a take on that, Ben? Yeah, I, I think it, yes, but I think really what we need to kind of start counteracting is the, uh, everyone seems to think that fish en masse are healthy for you, period, full stop. This is a health food, right? You're, we're transitioning you from this protein source to this healthier protein source. Whether or not that's true, it will apply to that individual person, et cetera, et cetera. But what we do know is that a lot of these fish farms are dirty. Um, they're you, you end up consuming uh, heavy metals that are being found now in a lot of um, uh, farm fishes and wild caught fishes. Microplastics in wild, wild caught fishes are rampant. Um, the quality of fish oil, fish oil supplements have gone through the roof. And there's been testing of these fish oil supplements, and that's not what you're getting. That's not that's not what is in there. And so we need to start kind of counteracting the whole idea that every single fish always is a healthier option and start, you know, showing people that, no, 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 no. The way and the method that we're getting these fishes nowadays is so much less healthy and is, in fact, could be, you know, dangerous for your long-term health. So whether or not that leads right into the, the certification stuff, sure. Um, but I think that's a narrative that needs to get flipped over a little bit. Mm -hmm. I love that, Ben. Yeah, thank you so much. That's so important. Um, okay, we have about three minutes left. So I want to do a little round, Robin. And I just, it, last uh, word, uh, re resource, maybe there's a campaign that you think people should check out. Maybe there's a video you think they should check out, or maybe there is an action um, that you feel that, you know, the people in this community that are sort of hungry to do something um, should take. Um, so let's um, start with, with um, Sofika, Sofika, what recommendations on moving the needle as an animal av advocate? What, where would you sort of direct people? I mean, there's there's so many groups doing fantastic work. A lot of the work, um, like activism, activism that's grassroots oriented, is much more local. Um, so I would I would see what's happening in your kind of own backyard and see if there are groups that you can support. Um, and I think community activism is really critical. There's, of course, a plethora of options to plug in and be an armchair activist and signing petitions. All of that totally matters. Sign petitions, send letters, make phone calls, you know, spread the news on social media. Don't sit silent on it is my one request. Um, and educate yourself about it. I mean, fishes and aquatic animals are so magical, so mystical. We we just don't know barely anything about them. Um, a book that I recently read is called The Soul of an Octopus, and it actually takes place in the New England Aquarium. And it's this uh, one woman's experience with a series of um, Pacific octopus. I think they're giant Pacific octopuses that are there and they, they live about four years and a few years in captivity. Um, but her personal experiences with these individual animals and how, um, how touched she was and it just changed her life path after interacting so closely with these animals. Um, she learned how to dive. She, she became a really hardcore activist. Um, so just yeah, it, immerse yourself in the world of fishes and uh, the the aquatic world. We depend on it um, for our own for our own um, life, <laughs> I guess, mm -hmm. on this planet. Um, just please don't turn a blind eye. I guess. Yeah, and we'll put the Aquatic Life Institute, um, Sofika's organization, in the uh, in the chat. So you make sure to check that out. Uh, Angela, what uh, what would you like to impart? Well, I'm a big believer, Kimberly, in like everybody is I like this saying. You know, you're famous in your own kitchen. 
you know, like, like I might not be famous anywhere else, but I'm famous in my own kitchen. And it sort of connects to that idea that like, you kind of know best, like where your most immediate direct impact would be. And that's going to be really different for all of us. Cause we're, we have different skill sets. We have different roles, jobs, and, you know, available free time and all these different things. And so, you know, like we had someone in the working group yesterday who was presenting a poem that she had written. She's a literature professor. She wrote this poem and it starts off about a story about an octopus and her encountering a severed octopus arm in a restaurant and how it basically like moved her to write this poem about how, you know, she's not going to go to restaurants anymore that serve any animal products. It was kind of like the turning point for her. And she shared that, but in this very, very subtle way that was like, if you read it, it wasn't like kind of hitting you over the head or making you feel like, oh, you have to also do that, but just very powerful and very, very moving. And so like, that's her way of doing that. And because she's so good at it, that's what's the most effective, you know, for someone like me, I'm going to like, you know, maybe criticize a legal thing that's happening. And actually I was going to put in a chat. I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, I'll just send it to you, Kimberly. It's like an example of this fish farm collapse that happened in Newfoundland in 2019. And mm -hmm. there were these inquiries and they were all very, like, not really very serious. And I wrote an article basically criticizing it. And it looks like it may have had some impact in terms of the Newfoundland government and what they're now saying about the fish farms. They're actually going to require, sounds ridiculous that it's so basic, but environmental assessments, keeping track of how many animals they've got, how many animals die. You think that was would be, you know, already in place, but it's not. And so there's a little bit of needle moving there, but that's because that's kind of more in my skill set, you know? So I feel like it's, that's what it's about is kind of figuring out like what, like, and if you make a documentary film about fish, amazing, you know, but like not everybody can do that. So what's your thing? Mm, love that. Thank you. Ciao. You just put um, a video uh, link into the chat. Tell us, tell us, this is, this is the golden ticket. This is the one that we should all watch. I personally think it's a really great video. Um, I think it's very accessible to everyone who might not think twice about fish. And it really tells like a really compelling story. Um, I won't go too much into it. Go watch it. I think it's incredible. Um, but I wonder it's if called I could share. How, how Conscious Can a Fish Be? So if they want to yeah. look it up on YouTube, it's called How Conscious Can a Fish Be? Okay, amazing. And what else were you um, going to say, Chow? Yeah, just one last thing, which is that I think that there might be an angle for us in the movement to tie aquaculture together with this idea, with this, with the fact that it's actually kind of an elitist endeavor. No person, at least in the global north, has ever said that they're living on minimum wage and has made the claim that they need to buy salmon as a cheap protein source to feed their family. Like that, it's unheard of. And so really aquaculture is just feeding wealthy nations that want to greenwash their wild caught seafood. And so I think it's not, you know, those who can afford these things are really just like corporations and then the wealthy who can afford. So it's not helping folks who really need a sustainable food source. So I think there's an opportunity to capitalize on a growing sentiment of the rich having an outsized impact on the planet, on people, on animals, like private jets and cruise ships are coming under fire now. And I think we could connect that to aquaculture in a similar vein. Yes, very smart, Chow. Thank you so much. Ben, what 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 do you want to gear us towards here? Uh, listen to Kimberly and everything she says and how to be a, be a good advocate. Um, no, no, but seriously, um, engage with the excellent work that these panelists have done. Um, a lot of them have spent the, the bulk of their career on these issues. Um, you know, engaging with that work will allow you to speak intelligently with your um, close knit group. And we know it all starts with the people in your kitchen. Like Angela said, everyone that's right around you, that's where this, this kind of work has to begin. Um, I think with the caviar campaign, for example, the octopus farm campaign, for example, this is the quote unquote low hanging fruit. I'm not saying it's easy work, but it is the beginning of, you know, it, these are the targets that we need to start at. And I think we're, we've chosen the right targets. Yeah. Um, so um, keep going after those targets. And, you know, once one falls, the next will fall and the next will fall. So 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and it's important, you know, this, this investigation, we're calling for a ban um, on caviar. We're also calling, you know, um, for the government to pay attention to the fact that there's no laws for fishes. Um, and, and so, you know, if we can take caviar down, it's the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Um, and um, yeah, we, we start and we don't, we don't stop. So um, let uh, Kirsten, if you can put the reminders of the two actions that folks can take, you can either share the video on one of the social media platforms or, uh, and we'd like you to do both. And there's also uh, the e-letter to sign to go to the ministers uh, the, of the federal government in Canada. And last word to what a fish knows, because this is one of the biggest books that can get you like uh, ready to advocate for fishes. Um, Jonathan, I don't know if you were going to say it, but I'm going to say it. You need to, you need to read what a fish knows. And we put it in the chat. What else can, what, what, what are you going to leave us with Jonathan? How are you going to steer us? Well, I think it's, it's, it's important to be positive and, and that's what I would normally emphasize, but I, I did re at least recently learn a statistic that was very sobering to me. And I just want to share it with people. It's from a, an article published in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences about five years ago, very pre prestigious journal. So pay attention to what they say. Uh, a group of scientists estimated the the measured the biomass of vertebrates on Earth. So this is actually excluding fish in the, in the numbers, but the, 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 the you'll get the idea. Um, a hundred thousand years ago, before we had animal agriculture, the ratio of wildlife to hominids there was more than one human species at that time was about um, 90, 99 point six percent for the wildlife, 04 percent for humans. And now uh, the numbers are ridiculous. 36% humans, 60% livestock, quote unquote. And you do the math, 4% for wildlife. So we, we really, we're truly in the Anthropocene. And if, if that, those numbers for livestock and humans don't, don't, don't speak for anything else, they certainly speak for we need to change our diet. We need to change our eating habits. That's, that's, gonna, that's imperative. Um, we need to control our numbers as well, of course. But um, so, you know, back to the earlier comments about dietary choices, that's absolutely fundamental to making change, positive change for animals and, of course, for ourselves as well. Mm. Alleluia, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, can we take everybody off spotlight, Kirsten, so uh, our panelists can see the community that has been just drinking them in? Um, panelists, you may need to go over to the gallery view to be able to see everybody. Um, so uh, AJAers, can we please give and show our deep appreciation for our panelists tonight? Let's give them a big thank you to Sofika, to Angela, to Ben, to Chow, to Jonathan. You have really, um, we uh, have gotten so much out of your wisdom, out of your kindness tonight, um, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I will just let you know, um, if you, uh, I love the programming that we do at Animal Justice Academy, um, please consider donating. Uh, Kirsten will put that uh, link into the chat and uh, do make sure that you check out all of the organizations uh, and all the work that was represented here tonight. Uh, we, I'm so happy, like you folks that are here that have gathered in the community tonight, you're, you're, you really care about fishes and you want to get better at advocating and, and to me, panelists, that is one of the most heartening things that that makes me feel really encouraged about the future. So thank you, everybody. We'll see you for our next AJ event uh, at Lunchtime Live in two weeks from now. Uh, stay tuned for emails on that and we'll see you soon. Take care, everyone. Bye.